All right. Okay. Hello, friends. Hello, everyone. And by the way, there's room up here. There's a completely empty table up here, all y'all in the back. Or if you like where you're at, that's just fine. But there is room up here. Um, my name is Matthew Booker, and I'm the Vice President for Scholarly Programs at the National Humanities Center. And that means it's my joy to introduce today's Scholar to Scholar conversation. And what I want to do um, before I do that is just I make a couple of special welcomes. This is a very unusual day. And it's a, a very, it's a red letter day on my calendar. And that is in part because of the extraordinary event we're about to participate in, this conversation between scholars, but also because of the mix of people who are in the room with us today. So one special guest is to my left, and that's Kathy Brigham, who is Executive Director of Higher Education Academic Outreach at the College Board and a friend of the center. Welcome, Kathy. Welcome. Also with us today is Professor Robin Kelly, who is here. And next to him, Professor Lydia Lindsay. So you're going to get worn out with all these hand clapping. And my goodness, this is wonderful. Um, and also sitting at this table with me in a moment, she'll be here in a moment, is Crystal Regan, who is the education, chief education officer of the North Carolina Museum of History. And in fact, there is Crystal, just in time for her, for your applause, Crystal. <laughs> Please. Excuse me. Absolutely, no problem. And then a really critical part of our audience today, very special to me, are participants in our Teaching African American Studies Institute. The number of all of the teachers who are here filling the room, and I would love to give you a, a hand. Welcome. Welcome. So that's a very special mix. It's also a mix that I think is actually right in our sweet spot at the National Humanities Center to bring together top-notch, world-class, top-of-their-field scholars, together with people who enter classrooms and speak to the public, and, I have to say, very much so, public humanities scholars, public humanists like yourselves. That's the mix that we aim for in our education and scholarly programs. And, of course, the base of our, of our community today is the staff and the fellows of the National Humanities Center who make up um, our day-to-day community here at the center. So welcome to you, fellows and staff. So scholar to scholar is not a formal talk. This is a model of conversation amongst our fellows that differs from the ones that are often found at universities or scholarly institutions. This is an informal conversation between two fellows, in this case, two fellows and a special guest. And it's followed by, enters into, opens up a conversation about a critical topic that they are speaking to, something that they know something about as scholars, but also enter into in their own lives. So today, two of our distinguished scholars and a very distinguished guest will lead that conversation. And the topic is family as a knowledge methodology, writing intimate histories. So I want to introduce our three leaders, all of whom will be sitting at this table, and who are standing cleverly behind this, <laughs> this small wall. <laughs> On the left is Blair Kelly, who is director of the Center for the Study of the American South, co-director of the Southern Futures Initiative, and Joel R. Joel R. Williamson, distinguished professor of Southern Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Thank you, Blair. And on the other end of the wall is Tiffany Willoughby Harrard, who is Professor Extraordinari Extraordinarius and the Chief Albert Lutuli. Can you pronounce that for me? Lutuli? Lutuli. Research Chair at the University of South Africa and Associate Professor of African American Studies at the University of California, Irvine. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you. 
And joining our two fellows is LaRonda Manigo Bryant, who is director of the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black Culture and History and professor of African, African American, and Diaspora Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Welcome. Welcome. So I must say those descriptions are so minimalist. They are minimalist. They are merely professional and really extremely skimpy. I mean, I have another version of my introduction, which is two pages long and is in my pocket. Because in addition to being skimpy about your professional accomplishments and achievements and aims, they also don't truly acknowledge the work that these scholars do to mentor, to advise, and to hold up and lift up others, both within and beyond their academic communities. And I've seen that firsthand. I think we, the staff and fellows, have seen that firsthand from Tiffany and from Blair this year. And I know this is true of you too, Ron. It's an honor as well as a pleasure to have you speak with us today about the role of family stories as a method for humanity's work. So welcome to the three of you. Yes. It, occur it occurs to me that I might have asked one more thing, which is that after they feel that their conversation has come to a good point, maybe with 30 minutes or so left around 145, uh, 1245 or so, that they will open up for conversations with all of you, and I will run this microphone around. So just raise your hand when we come to that point. All right. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. How y'all doing? Good. Um, I am Ron Manigo Bryant. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so excited to be in conversation with Blair and Tiffany. And I, I thought I would start, they asked me to, well, I've been invited into this conversation um, to moderate potentially, but really I just thought the energy among us suggests that we're just gonna have um, a conversation and I hope you all won't mind witnessing. <laughs> um, I thought I would begin by telling you all a story. So uh, I direct the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black uh, Culture and History at UNC. Um, I'm 39 days into that job. <laughs> um, and I came to UNC by way of Williams College where I had been for almost 15 years teaching Africana studies um, where we achieved departmentalization and now we have a major and so all these kind of momentum building things and at the moment that I was interviewing for the job which sometimes I you know just kind of get the impetus to do I did a search in the university's browser and when I searched the university's browser I looked for my last name Manigo it's like let's see you know and what comes up are the papers of the slaveholders who owned my family Right. So, you know, when you're in the process of considering a move to a place, there are a number of ways to interpret that moment. Right. I could interpret that moment as, <laughs> all right, <laughs> here we go. Uh, you know, here, here is something to explore because I, I actually didn't know where those papers were housed. I mean, I, I've been to the, I'm from the South Carolina Low Country. I've been to the Manigo House where in another sidebar and maybe at some other point uh, I went um, and they tried to have me pay the entrance fee, and I was like, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, but, you know, for me, it was a really, for me, how it felt to discover that those papers in all of their mm -hmm. form were there at the place that I was considering going to, as I was like, ah, there's work to be done, right? There's work from the perspective of my ancestral connections to be done in this space. So um, I told that story when I went for my visit and you know, folks were kind of like surprised but also not surprised. Um, the thing that was most striking to me in that moment was literally looking at the names of the slaveholding family and recognizing my aunts and uncles who also have names, right, based on Lewis and Charles, you know. Um, and I felt for me that it was a, a potential homecoming of sorts. Right. And so I'd like to start our conversation by thinking about and talking about home. What are the ways, uh, Blair and Tiffany, that you wrestle with, uh, 
thinking about and incorporating home into the work that you do? So for me, I, th I think um, that's, that same journey, as you know, is at play in the, the book I just finished writing. It's called Black Congratulations. Hope. Yes, Thank Blair. <laughs> um, and I begin with my ancestors, but I begin in a place that I had never heard of. Um, I'm the child of migration. And um, I think uh, those migrations created displacement. Mm. They were born of violence. They were born of um, disfranchisement. They were born of economic exploitation. And so people left with, you know, nothing, really, but, but what they had in themselves. So the ways that stories were passed down to me were um, very simple in some cases, some very complex in others, but all of them were uh, leaving out so much of where they came from because it was painful, because it was difficult. And so um, I had the, the, the pleasure of doing a reconstruction of those stories of my family um, in this research. And so uh, a place called Elbert County, Georgia, which I'd never heard of, I'd just heard Georgia from my maternal grandfather, and that they had run like slaves um, to escape a, a fake debt as sharecroppers. And doing the work on Elbert County, I started to unpack um, a longer history, uh, uh, an ancestor, uh, named Henry, who was a blacksmith and was owned by um, Squire Rucker in Elbert County, the wealthiest slaveholder, the largest slaveholder in that county. And so um, to be connected so fundamentally to a place I'd never heard of um, speaks to the violence, speaks to um, the awfulness of that ancestral home that um, my enslaved ancestors were brought from Virginia to Georgia as part of that um, colonization of that land. And so it's really profound to now know so much about a place that there was such a deep and abiding silence about. Uh, my, my ancestors from South Carolina talked a lot about where they were from. So Newberry, South Carolina, um, where my mother's mother were, was from, um, there was violence there too, but they, that was a story they wanted to share. Mm. Um, and so there's a, a Blair plantation. Um, I am named after the people who held us in bondage in my first name, mm. which I sort of knew. And then when I saw the plantation, I was like, oh, mm. okay. <laughs> um, and so those layers of um, knowing and, and silence are really interesting for me in thinking about the process of a home and, and what that might mean. Yeah. So that there are so many different kinds of homes yeah. and yet there is a brokenness hmm. and a, a sadness hmm. around each one of them. Thank yeah. you so much for that question. Um, I'm thinking about the Rosenwald Fund mm. <laughs> and living in California and um, meeting two people that are from the same place in South Carolina that are also black academics. Yeah. So Monica Coleman yeah. is from Honey Pass, South Carolina, and James Taylor is another political scientist. And we were sitting at a dinner party, and we both got on the phone with our grandmothers, and James was saying, I gave my child sermon at the age of 12 in your grandfather's church. Wow. Um, and I said, the Rosenwald Fund, because that was one of the places where there was a Rosenwald school. Yeah. And um, between the Rosenwald School and the Baptist Church community, three pastors went, um, they called themselves the Three Brothers, they went in three different directions. One stayed in Anderson County, one moved to Battle Creek, Michigan, and one moved to Long Island, and whole families followed them. Whole families followed them. Um, so my, I think, Part of the thing that's hard for me about the question of home is the, the deliberate intention to claim each other mm. um, yeah. when the actual experiences are pushing each other apart, mm -hmm. right? So um, 
I don't know if y'all remember the Pattern Master series, that old series that um, Octavia Taylor Butler, Butler yeah. mm -hmm. did. Sure. And I remember my older brother, who I only saw like once every six years as a child or once every seven years as a child, giving those to me in college. And um, the, the thing I took from the stories is there was a family of people who were superheroes. Mm. And these superheroes had these kinds of capacities that when they were close to each other, they would inadvertently hurt each other. Mm -hmm. So it was better for them to be like a fire starter in one place, yeah. but not be a fire starter in the house with the person who's the water maker. I'm yeah. only remembering it a little bit. Yeah. And so um, that was one of the first healing moments, like a deep cosmological moment when I understood what it meant in my own family for people to have to be away from each other mm -hmm. and to still choose to have spiritual bonds with each other and to still um, have imaginary lives together that weren't the kind of lives that you can touch and share a meal with or sleep in the same bed or those kinds of things. So um, I think the other thing I want to talk about is that we're in a moment, at least as I can perceive it, we're in a moment where the younger people all around us are so desperately hungry for spiritual and creative lives. And um, when you listen to the music or the pictures that they're drawing or just the ways that they're moving, um, just so hungry for meaning and so willing to take risks and so disturbed by the set of practices of um, cheap exploitation and I'm gonna make a fast buck on your body and, um, and I wanna really, I wanna follow the type of home that they're imagining. I wanna really be present in the ways that they're asking us to be like water. Mm. Um, and the kind of earnestness that they're calling for, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not, I mean, it's not easy to raise giants, mm -hmm. yeah. right? It's not, it's not easy to be in the company of people who are absolutely hungry. Y'all remember um, there were these kids at Parkland, right? And you remember the Undocu kids and the Dreamer kids and the Movement for Black Lives kids and the Black Lives Matter kids and the We're Gonna Defend Dobbs kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are like, mm -hmm. like we're in the presence of incredible, incredible, incredible resources. What is the thing they have in Wakanda? What is it called? The, the, the metal? The vibranium? vibranium? We got vibranium. <laughs> <laughs> All under 18, <laughs> walking right. around. That's right. You know, like living vibranium. <laughs> mm. And we get the honor mm. to choose um, what we accompany them with, you know? That's a lot of the stuff for me yeah. that's about home. And it comes from those really painful experiences of the silences yeah. and the things that couldn't be said. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, this is, I mean, the, the ways that you all are both just complicating what home can and should mean, right? The silences and the, the voluminous speakings, the, the sense of, obligation or at least duty that we might have mm -hmm. across generations it, it just sparked for me i just wrote down a word balance mm -hmm. um <laughs> I, i'd love to know how if at all you achieve and maybe achieve is not even the right word but aspire to a type of balance because that what you're talking about is a, a it, there's a lot of accountability and responsibility in right and holding those spaces between the kind of speaking out and the silences and then passing that on or leaving that on for other generations so i'm curious particularly in light of the demands of our professions right <laughs> that want you to produce which i would say uh, tiffany how you're describing the kind of aspirationalism for young folks 
it, it's bred out, it's all connected, right? We're all, you know, essentially struggling with, I think, you know, commodification in different ways. So I'm curious to know, my, my question for you is, how do you aspire to or achieve, if you have, balance between holding the stories that you know should be told and want to tell in relation to those that might be as, you know, the great, <laughs> <laughs> As our profound storyteller Toni Morrison would say, this is not a story to pass on, right? Like, yeah. how do you hold those spaces? Um, yeah. I, I became fascinated with um, the practice hmm. that my ancestors passed down. And when I could think of them, I would think of the things that, that I was taught to do. Hmm and the spaces I was taught to inhabit and how I was taught to serve and, and to work. Like an attack Yes, sense. literally, because um, um, I conclude the book with talking about my grandmother, and she would grab my hand, and she would knead the dickens out of it. I was like a little tiny person. <laughs> and I was like, ah, ah. And so if you tried to pull. I'm sorry, what were you like? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you tried to pull away from her hand, it would get tighter. And so you learn to just sort of like go with it. <laughs> and just calm down mm -hmm. because she was going to just make sure you were right there and she was going to keep rubbing that hand. Mm. Um, I came to know that she lost, I think it's six family members mm. in a 10 year span um, in the process of migration. So in the COVID moment, it was making me think of the ways in which we practice our way through grief, the way in which we um, are still passing things down, but we're not, not sharing those things. So she never told me, yeah. you know, the loss. She had a sister that I'd never heard of, um, mm -hmm. her closest in, in age sister that she never mentioned. Um, but, you know, as a, as a teenager, it must have been such a profound loss. So, um, I, yeah. but what she passed me was that practice. So she had land. Um, that she eventually got in New Jersey and she, she farmed that land and she planted green beans and corn and tomatoes and okra and the foods that she knew from South Carolina, she wanted me to know in this new place. And so that practice of, of teaching me exactly how to pick a green bean without tearing up the plant and how to pick your strawberries so that if a few more strawberries wanted to come, you weren't uh, messing up that little bunch. Of, of flowers, and so she she was really attentive in in telling me those details and those tactile lived details. Mm. You know, my, my grandfather passed to my father in terms of sweet potatoes, and he was from Accomack, South Carolina. That was this massive crop that was important there. That black people were being cut out of the wealth that was being created um, by their own hands. But he brought that to his family and and distributed that food. So that practice of giving out, of serving, yeah. of um, being of use to your community. Um, I'm, a, I'm not third generation or fourth generation much, but I'm a fourth generation deaconess in my church. And so when I don that white and I serve, I'm in their tradition. Mm. And so that, that thinking of service is really um, a part of what surpassed the silence. Right, so you could you could talk about those things without digging into the, the depths of your pain, but you could pass down the things that your ancestors mm -hmm. had and knew, and the knowledge and the skill and the profound um, awareness that they carried with them. Mm -hmm. So for me, mm -hmm. that that's the balance that they provided for me, and so that's the balance I want uh, to model for our next generation. That mm -hmm. you know, my goal is to be of service mm -hmm. and to and to do work. Mm -hmm. uh, that serves my community mm -hmm. in ways that don't comply with sort of the ways in which um, yeah. the outside world would, would measure mm -hmm. success or work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love what you're saying, uh, Blair, and I've, I've seen it also. I've, I've witnessed it here, um, the, the kind of intimate practices. Mm -hmm. um, I would, the only thing I would add to that is uh, uh, seeking people who know home hmm. in a particular type of way. Yeah. And so wherever it is that I am seeking them and expecting them. George Lipset so, told me this a long, long time ago, and it was something that somebody else had told me. Daryl Thomas had told me this before George, but George said, whenever you're in a room, you have to assume that there are allies in the room. But the way that Daryl said it was, the room is never empty. Hmm. He said, no matter what it looks like, it's never, it's never empty. 
And so that was one of those things that kind of affirmed for me to look beyond what I can touch and see and feel right in front of me. Yeah. Um, and those have been really powerful, powerful insights. And it's, I think, made me be able to not be scared by, um, scared by the dictates of the workplace. Mm. It used to hurt my heart because one of my nieces mm -hmm. is a, all of my family, very accomplished artists. And one of my nieces um, lived with my wife and I, you know, we're both academics. And she was like, it looks like y'all work at the post office. It's, you know, it's a drag, what y'all do? And it, used to, <laughs> it used to hurt my feelings. Um, but right in this moment, mm. there was so much wisdom in what she was saying about um, being employed by the state and mm. you know carrying messages and having benefits, mm. <laughs> yeah. having a dream of being able to retire one day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was completely in truth about that particular statement, and um, you know the balance for me is doing everything I can to be unafraid that there's not another post office out there for me to work at. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> there's always another post office. <laughs> and I don't mean just literally, I just mean like that relation. Like, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. As somebody who just moved institutions after almost 15 years and almost 20 years 20. for both of our cases, okay. there's always another post office. <laughs> <laughs> there's always another post office, thankfully, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I want to shift just a, a little bit because there was something in the first part of our, our thread um, in terms of the kind of layers of knowing, right? And I'm curious to, to hear what have you learned about yourself in being in this space, in the National Humanities Center? What, what, what is the new thing that you have learned or seen about yourself that you had not known or had not crystallized? And how is this particular space and being, you know, in some ways unfettered from our professional responsibilities, right? You know, some ways, as I said, some ways. Because it, it always creeps up, right? There's always something to do. Work always calls, family, et cetera, right? Uh, Matthew's over there shaking, shaking his, waggling his finger. But yeah, what are, what are the things that you've learned about yourself um, that, that have surprised you or that you just, you know, have crystallized in a different way? And how has this space, you think, afforded, you know, the kind of room to, to, for that learning? Well, I've always known that this place was with goals, right? You know, I've never been confused about the National <laughs> Humanities Center from the, the moment I understood what it was, and um, I, I've, I've, I've honored it, and I, I've thought of it as extremely important to have the practice of just turning into yourself mm. and um, have the space, you know, simply to, to think a bit and to slow down. Because yeah. so often we think of the production of our writing as you know something we gotta get cranking and boy that's not how it really works I mean you really have to sit with things and get delayed and hear from other people I mean if I hadn't heard from you in the process of this book if I hadn't heard from you and and thinking about what it looks like now um, so many of my colleagues here uh, who've just spoken you know to a word to a, a, a choice to a um, a decision that I had to make about how to frame things. So um, that's that's really a gift. Mm. I mean, we don't, as a country, honor thinking very much. Mm. And so I think this space fights against that practice mm. of really, you know, providing you with a lovely meal and a space and some time and smart conversation. Mm. Is that's revolutionary in this world. Um, where so many people don't want you to think at all. Yeah. So um, uh, it's been really profound in the process of, you know, making an academic home. Um, when I've, you know, really done this kind of work in a very um, hook or crook kind of way, like in the middle of the night, like you go teach and then you come home and then you stay up all night and yeah. you write. Yeah. Um, it's how I've always done my work. And mm. so um, having something that's expansive is a little scary but also uh, such a blessing for 
that, that space. Yeah. And so it really does become like a, a bit of an academic home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about um, the fact that I learned what a mercy it is to be okay with struggling to learn. Mm. I kind of, I didn't know that that was actually a particular blessing. I, I didn't know. I just always, you know, I'm like that kind of person who wanted to be like, everybody can sing, like everybody can write, everybody can do, and it's just an incredible, it's a mercy. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible, incredible mercy. It's a superpower. It's a sign of being loved. It's a sign of having people pour into you simply to want to study, simply to want to think, simply to want to reflect, simply to be able to um, be willing to struggle with those yeah. things that are available to you and only you and that are trying to surface. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so um, the other thing I've learned is that you can have a practice of turning into yourself without being mad at anyone else. <laughs> and where I, where I live, there is a lot of sensibility around we must turn into ourselves and do what Omar Badsha calls create spaces for seed time, but it also is cloaked with so much um, uh, like, like almost an eco, eco side of everything else around and you don't have to be mad at nobody else to turn into yourself. You just, it's not required. Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, when Matthew called me and said, um, you know, I'm Matthew Booker from National Humanities Center, I had to get off the phone and um, roll all over the floor <laughs> of my office. <laughs> Um, Karima, I had the whole holy ghost. <laughs> Robert, I think I was a Pentecostal for about 10 minutes. Well, y'all know I will dance anytime. <laughs> if it's good news, I'm about to dance about it. But um, I have learned that there are still places of marinage and fugitivity and they yeah. are well-funded and they are beautiful and they will fight for you mm. and they will pour into you to encourage you to fight for yourself. Mm. And I knew that in little tiny bits because like you having to do the work in just really ridiculous kinds of conditions just ridiculous yeah. um, and it's so funny too because the the colleague who's one of the trustees um, who told me to apply she had been saying it for a really long time and I just I didn't believe it was possible mm -hmm. I didn't believe it was for me mm -hmm. I was like I just have to keep doing my work in these really negative, deflating, demoralizing, mm. unkind, damaging mm. to my spirit ways. Mm. And I have just really been affirmed around the possibilities of um, being alive and not dying at a young age because mm. higher education wants to kill me. Mm. Yeah. Um, Matthew, I just want to make sure in terms of time, how much <laughs> if you wish to take questions from all, from all, from everybody, you're welcome to do that. We'll probably wrap up about 1.15, but we can push it to 1.30 for this extraordinary Maybe one more question. Yeah, well, why don't, why don't I just raise one more, and we can put that as a seed moment, so let it, you know, marinate, germinate your questions. Um, I would just like to, you know, ask how <laughs> for, you know, it is no small thing for you know three black women to be sitting in this space and talking about the freedom to think, right? Um, if there is, yes, yes, <laughs> all day for that. Um, I, I'd love to know if you had to look back and tell your younger self. <laughs> I love that Blair's like, oh no. <laughs> um, what it, given what it is that you know now, if you had to tell your younger self, give your younger self some advice around making room for yourself to 
to think and to be free in whatever space, what would you say? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I think I would. I might tell her to go get like some other kind of job first <laughs> and get some savings popping, <laughs> so she can then afford this lifestyle. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I, th I think I would be thankful um, to to know that like when I was in graduate school and I was reading Robin Kelly and I was reading Tara Hunter and I was like, okay, this is the Bible. This is how you do the work you mm -hmm. wanna do. I would eventually get some sense of my own guidance mm -hmm. and some sense of how I could find stories in that process too, that it wasn't gonna just be you know, outside of myself, that, that um, there is an ease once you find the thing you're supposed to be talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, there is um, um, a filling in yeah. that isn't me, right? Yeah. That, it, that is my ancestors, yeah. that is this family yeah. that stands behind me. And so, um, this is, I, you know, people say, oh, it's such hard work. I, this, is, this is the thing I love. Like, yeah. I love it more than anything in the world. And so, um, when you find the thing that is your thing, and when you are connected to it, and when you um, channel other ways of knowing, um, it, it really does become hmm. easier and more possible. And there's so much space. Hmm. Um, and to, to honor, so something you said to me early on, like right when the, evidently the pandemic was popping off and we were at your house um, and we didn't even know like how bad it was getting ready to be. Uh -oh, what <laughs> you said, <laughs> um, you gave me an Elsa Barkley Brown article and uh -huh. you said you have to honor all the ways that you know Mm. And they're all valid. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, okay, yeah. So I, I you know, yeah. little Blair probably needed to know that too, that the things she knew from her family, from her own experiences, they were just as valid as the, yeah. as the, the other ways of knowing that other people have access to, that, that oftentimes the people I study don't have um, have those, those records, not, their, their papers are not gonna show up, they didn't write a diary while they were doing those things, but the, those other ways are, are real yeah. and valuable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A big part of the, the book that I'm writing this year is about other academics, um, other scholar, academic scholar, activists. You know, Fatima Mir was like in the last five years of her life and was um, going out to stop evictions. <laughs> <laughs> of other of other granny so and so's who were like two years older than her, <laughs> um, you know, when she started school at the University of Natal, as it was called at that time, it was a segregated institution, and she and all the other Indian South Africans had to go to the night school. They weren't even allowed on that campus. Um, That's very moving to me that she was able to, it's not for everybody, that she was able to use her gifts to be able to stay inside that site of captivity and bring so many other people through. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I marvel at it. And I know that the reason why she has revealed pieces of herself to me is because she is trying to help me anchor in what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but I, I was 11 when my grandmother gave me Rose Butler Brown, who's an academic from the Northeast, um, had written a memoir called Love My Children about being a black teacher and being a black professor and having students live in her and her husband's home because they were teaching on campuses that didn't have housing for students. I was 11 when I read that. My grandmother, because of the church you know, relationship, had a whole box of Rose Butler Brown's books that I think probably Rose Butler Brown gave her. Mm -hmm. Those people told me who I was going to be mm. at that age. We didn't have children's books in my house. The first book that I read independently was Scottsboro Boy. Those people told yeah. me yeah. who I was going to be. Yeah. 
And I, even in my own life, it's hard for me to remember, even though I write about young people and I write about cross-generational, I forget how important it is to just talk to them. Just talk to them, just talk to them, just like talk to them, talk to them, talk to them, talk to them, talk to them. Talk to them on the page, talk to them in any way you can because, um, yeah. Anyway, if I was trying to make room for myself, there's this song by PJ Morgan that has been abiding with me since last week. It's called, Be Like Water, Watch It Flow, Water, Just Let Go. Be like water, where we'll end up, we don't know. Water, just let go. I, I wish I had been able to tell that to myself. Like every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'm sitting next to two people with both of them have boss voices. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we, we should open it up, please, yeah. Robin Kelly has a Robin Dr. Kelly has a question. <laughs> so that was beautiful. And not only that, there, there are four people sitting there. Like right next to you, Lorana, is um, Sonia Haynes Stone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I wanted to name her because it ties to something that Tiffany said about that, how important it is to live. I mean, I knew Sonia, I was a postdoc here. Mm. And she was the one who told, she was one of many, along with Jenna Ray McNeil and others who are still with us, of course, who told me what to do, where to go. Got Lydia Lindsay, who's part of that whole group of black women who raised me coming up when I tried to be a historian and they showed me what to do. And Sonia passed way too early. Yeah. Um, and yet her presence is so powerful here with you all. And I'm wondering, I don't know if people know who Sonia Stone was, if you might want to talk about her and also just talk about, you know, um, well, yeah, talk about her and, sure. and other things that might come up in terms of what I'm thinking about, just, you know, how important it is. Even our ancestors are with us all the time, you know, directing us in many ways. And my debt to black women scholars is, is bigger than, um, than the debt of the United States to China. Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> Always the political economist. <laughs> uh, I love that you have, you know, by name raised uh, Sonia Hainstone. I mean, I. <laughs> so, you know, she was a, a black woman faculty member at UNC Chapel Hill who, as Robin has said, died far too soon, right? Um, who spent her life at Carolina, among other things, but laboring on the behalf of black students, staff, faculty, community, period. So, and I, and I believe, you know, her, her time at UNC was in many ways fraught, right? Because she wasn't initially promoted, right? In the way that she should have, as which often happens, <laughs> Hannah Nicole Jones, um, you know, <laughs> in that space, right? You know, as, you know, Black women academics have to navigate all the time, you know, these, you know, very highly politicized and I would say deadly, yes. you know, um, interstices that come, come for our souls, right? You know, so she, you know, was the first director of the center that I now steward, right? And I steward a center that is a magnificent physical space, right? Which is its own thing to have a freestanding center, but not just like a freestanding center, it's like almost 50,000 square feet with an auditorium. <laughs> I mean, it's a beautiful, <laughs> magnificent space. Huge. So I'm so glad that you, you know, named her because I do feel, I mean, you talk about that ancestral draw, I talked about it in terms of my, you know, the slaveholders of my, you know, family, their papers being there, but it absolutely felt cosmically aligned for me to take 
on you know the legacy is what I thought there were like six directors but as the fourth director and only the second woman director mm -hmm. at the center so mm -hmm. it's named after her and people you know fought <laughs> and made sure that there was a space that honors you know her so yeah you know when, <laughs> when Tiffany is like you know I'm fighting against these systems that would try to end my life early yeah I mean that that hits home in all all manner of ways when I think about you know the, and it's and it's no disrespect to you know my white mentors and advisors and my male identified advisors and but black women have literally been holding me down my entire career when I think about who has done particular kinds of work for me so yeah I yeah and, and also I wrote this book called talking to the dead <laughs> right so it, that that the presence of ancestors and those who have gone before are with us and stay with us is something that I know metaphysically is something that I write about intellectually and is something that you know I encourage everyone to kind of tap into so part of what I mean I was really moved to ask in that first question about the ways that our pasts and our ancestors and those and how we think of home are always present because you know, we live in a world that would have us deny who we are <laughs> for the sake of it not being politically, you know, volatile, <laughs> if, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for bringing her into the room formally, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, um, for the educators in the room, I really was inspired by the idea of like the freedom to think. I think that's what we're here for. Yeah. So can you think of, you know, what was, you know, maybe a formative experience in your education as a child that inspired you to kind of pursue that freedom to think, um, you know, thinking along the lines of what we can do to better serve our students? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm Sarah Wiseman. I'm from Frisco High School in, or no, Liberty High School in Frisco, Texas. What's interesting for me is that um, the spaces that I were in high school were spaces of challenge, right? So I walked into um, my 11th grade year into, I believe it was an AP class. Um, <laughs> and the, the teacher said, oh, this, this is the AP class. And nodded at me like, you found the wrong room. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm here. And, and so all year was that year of me um, proving myself. But, you know, um, you know, once I did, I, there was space for me. But, I, I, you know, my mother was a, was a school teacher um, and did incredible work. She was a, a, a third grade teacher, um, a kindergarten teacher briefly, but she said it was a terrible year. And <laughs> um, a second grade teacher for a while. And, so, so for, for me, I always had that model of you can build it yourself. You can know for yourself. So she would take me to the largest library in South Jersey, and I was, I was reading um, David Levering Lewis's Du Bois in high school, trying to figure out how to write about Reconstruction and how to talk about this time period um, that I w wasn't being taught in high school. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think... Uh, teachers are, um, can be deadly, and teachers can be um, life-giving. Yeah. And so uh, I'm thankful that those teachers who misjudged me uh, just by, based on how I looked changed their minds mm -hmm. and did better. Um, but, and I'm also thankful that, that in me was something that couldn't be broken by those interactions. Oh, yeah. and, so, um, and so those questions have been interesting to me mm -hmm. Uh, from from that point forward, and 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 that spirit of um, you said doing it anyway. I, I, I can't, you said it so beautifully about um, you know your seed being like f y'all, yeah. you know, like getting in the ground and fighting. That that's what I had in in, in high school. But that spirit of there's something else that y'all y'all are not telling me, and I'm going to go get. Um, it's, it's something that you can give your students. Um, even as they encounter people who are not as interested or not as focused or not as enriching as you are, mm -hmm. you can be um, part of, of, of nurturing their seed of resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So I remember Mrs. Dibble mm. in like third grade. I actually had a teacher called Mrs. Dibble. And she sent me home with a little pin that said like excellence on my collar. I don't, mm. I don't even, I'm a third grade, fourth, I don't know, sometime elementary school. And at that time we were living in a house with a lot of other people. And so one of the other kids took it and I was so embarrassed because I had been wearing it on my little collar every day. And um, I just told her, like, it just got lost in my house. And she just gave me another one. <laughs> there was no judgment. There was no judgment about it. Mm. Um, and I didn't have to tell her the whole story and all this kind of stuff. She was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I went to Catholic school, and there was a nun who had been to Haiti. Nuns are some of the most well-educated women in the United States, like some of the highest, you know, like most well-educated women. Um, and she found out that my, my stepdad was Haitian American and she like invited herself over to dinner and um, it was wonderful just to watch them talk, you know. Um, uh, I went to my mother's graduation. I was in third grade when my mother graduated from university. Um, and that, you know, I'm always telling my undergraduate students, like we celebrate this thing being first generation, you know, first in your family to go to college. And I'm like, I wish my students would encourage their parents to enrol in the university because, you know, 20 year olds is like dealing with kindergartners and bless, bless their souls, bless their souls. I would almost any day be willing to have a conversation with a mother, father, auntie, grandma, anybody other than the 20 year olds. And I love, and I love them and respect them and learn a lot from them. And um, so I think the thing of like remembering that the people who are the caregivers for your students mm -hmm. are also learners yeah. mm -hmm. and they're not learners and that they're adult learners, right? So the kind of role that you can play in their lives yeah. too is really powerful. It's like the way that schools anchor communities, libraries anchor communities. When you don't have those kind of public institutions, um, you know, historical societies, museums, they anchor neighborhoods, community centers, elder centers, they anchor neighborhoods and when you don't have those um there, you lose a sense of place you lose a sense of time you lose a sense of obligation you don't get to learn who you are how you are all of those things um so i think engaging the parents and the caregivers in that celebration of the places you all probably remember i can't remember if it was before covid or during covid <laughs> there were these teachers who during Black History Month would make these fantastic art doors. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You remember? And they were like paper mache yeah. and stuff. They went all over social media. Um, that takes a lot of time, you know, to do something like that. Or even those teachers who do things like, you know, they, they featured on Abbott Elementary, like they shake every kid's hand when they come in the classroom or hug them when they go. That kind of stuff to me is the, um, Y'all know Alexis Pauline Gum. She has this book called Revolutionary Mothering. Yeah. One of the, the most important things about the book is she says, we have other mothering and we also have M slash othering. Mm -hmm. Like it's about who's willing to do the social reproduction labor. It's not your gender, right? And so I was really blessed in my life to have a lot of male role models, teachers, educators who were 100% um, enriched by black women's leadership, not afraid of black women's leadership, yeah. and um, who knew how to pour in and to, and to nurture and to do that M slash othering work. Mm -hmm. um, so I think capitalizing on who those people are in your environment, and they may not be your, your other teacher friends, yeah. they might be the cleaning person yeah. at the building. They might be the person who cooks. I don't know what we have to do, Matthew, to get those t-shirts that say humanities, you know, people who, those who teach, whatever that t-shirt that Tom is wearing all the time in yeah. the back. I want that t-shirt so bad. <laughs> I, I want us all to have that t-shirt. <laughs> Your word is, our, is my command. Say again? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karima Jeffrey Lee Gett. I'm one of the resident fellows here. I'm an associate professor at Hampton University. And I want to come back to our moderators uh, grounding us in the idea of home. Mm -hmm. And so first, 
I want, I don't know if you all, for the teachers in the room, are familiar with Trudia Harris's latest work, uh, Depictions of Home in African American Literature. Mm -hmm. She worked on that here, 2018, 2019, when she was a fellow here for the second time. And the description that I went to as you were asking a question and sharing comments is how Home for African Americans comes off of the publisher's website is a space of dislocation, mm. dysfunction, and violence. Mm -hmm. And the literature captures that at the same time that the African American home, as captured in our canonical literature, is a site inhabited by love and endurance mm. and a place of strength and resilience and demonstrates our spiritual rootedness. So for me, what I love and appreciate about your opening is the way in which the idea of home for us as African descended people shifts and morphs. Mm. And that's resonating with me. Mm. So I know that, Blair, your work is anchored there. And for me as a literary scholar, it very rarely is. Mm. But now my work and the challenge is moving into that. Wow. How does my story mm. intersect with these scholars that I'm querying with these texts that I'm analyzing. And so, now I have to get my notes back up. And so I wanted to share, because you started there, LaRonda, the first presentation this year in our cohort, one of the first, was Greg Hikovich's. I don't think he's here. Oh, you are? Okay. And he talked about the Columbia 7 daguerreotypes in South Carolina. Well, I'm a descendant mm. of that area. And these images that are very popular, very familiar, that I've seen my whole life, it was not till his presentation mm. when he mentioned the Stovers, who are my ancestors, that I said, wow, there's story there for me. There's work there for me. So for you to open that way, LaRonda, and going back to UNC Chapel Hill and that family name, it says how, from, I'm just sharing, I guess, how I'm moved and growing from what you all have presented for us today. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. And so the Stovers, my kin, the Drakefords, the Jacksons, the Browns, the Kirklands, and how do I now build on the work that Greg and others have done yeah. in one capacity to now intersect with my return home here? Your last question, how is it being here at the center informing you? Here I am working in North Carolina. I discovered this about my roots in South Carolina. So I wanted to share. I think that's wonderful, and it's, it's just a reminder that there are no accidents yeah. in the work that we do. There's nothing that we know or discover that we shouldn't know yeah. or shouldn't discover. And um, that journey of knowing, it, it's an insistent one, right? So it, even if you hadn't uh, followed up, it, it would have followed you. And so um, I, I think that's such a gift. And so thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. That's incredible. Folks, I think we're going to end there because it's well into, it's past our time, and I want to honor our presenters and the energy that you've put into this. Thank you so much. Got my, got my, got my.